I'm with Teresa Wontachihi, who's here at the Holocaust Museum in Auschwitz. Now, uh, everyone knows the name Auschwitz. What is Auschwitz? Auschwitz today, it's mainly associated with the former concentration camp. So in today's perspective, to refer to this place, it's just the State Museum Auschwitz-Birkenau, how this is how is it called officially. And today it includes actually two places, the main camp, Auschwitz I, and Birkenau, which is the uh, another place the visitors may see. But we include the two places as the integral history. So uh, working here and also coming here to see this place, the people are visiting the, the two places. Is it actually as it was in 1945? Uh, well, of course, everything has changed. First of all, after the war, the camp itself was still a complex. Today I mentioned the two places, but actually Auschwitz as a camp was the three major camps, Auschwitz I, Auschwitz to Birkenau, Auschwitz III Monowitz, and 40 smaller subcamps. And as the liberation was here in January 1945, first of all, the, the country was ruined, was devastated by the uh, Germans, by the army, and also in terms of, of the uh, population, in terms of economy, was ruined. So now it's so many years after, so everything has changed. And just to be more precise, before the war, Auschwitz uh, I, well, actually that was the name Oświęcim, that's the Polish name, which was changed into German uh, in 1939, was the base for Polish forces, for Polish soldiers. So that's the buildings, they looked slightly different. They were most of them having just one floor, only few were having two floors. So they, they changed, the place itself changed when the camp was set up here. And after the liberation, the mm, priority for the first directors, for the first people who took care of this place as the commemoration place, was to save as much as possible of the original objects. Mm -hmm. But of course, the time and also the economical situation of the country did not allow us to keep everything in the same state. And then also uh, just the normal living, the normal development of the town caused some uh, other limits. But we may say the most important, the most significant places of the camp existence, they are being uh, under the um, special care of, of the museum. And how many Jews were killed here in the camp? Well, in terms of victims of the camp, the historians are saying that uh, at least 1,300,000 people were deported to this place. So just to get the figures correct, at least 1,300,000 people were deported to Auschwitz. And in this number, 1.1 1 uh, 1 .1 were Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Then 150,000 were Poles, Poles from all over the country. Mm -hmm. Then 23,000 European gypsies, Romas. Then 15,000 Soviet prisoners of war. Then roughly 25,000 actually people from all over Europe, from um, Czech Republic, from France, from uh, Germany, Austria, Ukraine, Belarus, they were non-Jewish people. So Auschwitz was the place where many different people were sent. It's associated by most of the mm, uh, visitors that it's a place of the Holocaust, as most of the victims, most of the people brought here, they were Jewish people from all over Europe. But the first people, who were brought here, the first people the camp was set up for were Polish people, non-Jewish, members of Polish intelligence, mem members of Polish elites. Then the next group after the, the Polish transports were uh, Soviet prisoners of war, 
10,000 of them were uh, brought here, then more in, in different transports later on. Then the uh, people from Czech Republic. And later on in 1943, Romas set up in a family camp. So men, women, children were brought to Birkenau. So we have to remember ab about the different groups being deported here. That's why uh, Auschwitz actually is a place for commemoration of many different people, many different nationalities. And you can actually go into the barracks today. What were conditions like in the barracks and how many people actually lived in each of the barracks? Well, the conditions were very, uh, they varied depending where the, the people were uh, brought to. So if we consider Auschwitz I, the main camp and the buildings which were built for the army, so the official number was 700 people in each. But again, as the camp was overcrowded, so including basement and attic, it was many more. Birkenau was the camp built of the ruined village. Before the war, that was just ordinary Polish village called Brzezinka. And that was the Germans' idea to set up a new camp. So that's why the village was completely devastated. The people were to leave. And their houses, their, uh, the, the, um, uh, which were taken down, uh, the material was used to build new buildings in Birkenau. That's why we may see two types of buildings in Birkenau, red brick buildings and wooden barracks. The red brick were officially for 600 uh, women, as mainly uh, they were in the female sector. The wooden barracks officially were for 400 uh, prisoners. They were, the wooden barracks, they were produced as stables for horses. And in the packages, they were brought here. They were just put, um, the, the, the prisoners simply had to join all the planks. And this is how the uh, buildings uh, looked like. Of course, the conditions were catastrophal. The first serious problem in Birkenau was lack of sewage s system, lack of running water, and then the epidemics. Then, then the, uh, they, they slept just on a primitive beds with some straw, with blankets never washed, never changed, full of insects. So they were even moving because of the insects. So simply the epidemics were causing here uh, again, they, they caused the rises of the mm, victims. So a lot of people could have actually died of epidemic before they even got to the gas chambers. Uh, actually, uh, mm, for the gas chambers were taken the Jewish people who were brought here, who were taken for the selection upon arrival. Those who were considered as fit for work, they were taken for the camp and they were to work. Mm. In few cases, they also could be selected for the gas chamber, as from time to time the doctors were just uh, doing the selection in the camp to separate the uh, weaker, the very sick people, and then they were taken immediately for the gas chambers. How many people were killed a day here? There are different records, depending first of all on the period. There were some periods especially uh, since mid-May 1944, when they started to send here the mass transports of Hungarian Jews, that the numbers were very high. But then there were periods that there were actually no transports admitted for the camp, uh, or very small transports, like some groups from the local nearby prisons, and they were registered for the camp, so they were actually not sent for the gas chamber. We need to take the daily records to refer to these numbers. It, it's very difficult to say how many per day because it all depended on the war situation. And were people experimented on when they came here? Some of the physicians, uh, German scientists, they work. They were all already involved in different projects. So that's why having here that many people uh, in different age from different European countries, they were also coming here to work on some project they were already involved before the war. So some places were being even isolated for their purposes, like here in Auschwitz I, block number 10, 
was in the station for Professor Karl Klauberg and Dr. Horst Schumann, and they work on sterilization project. Then a few of the physicians here, they were in touch with pharmacy industry and, for example, well-known Bayer company, the famous producer of many medicines was also experimenting testing here some of the project uh, some of the products then mm, Birkenau was place where many of the physicians were all experimenting then the, the notorious was Josef Mengele who uh, was the lager artist of the Roma camp the Zigoina lager so called so the first victims of his experiments were the Roma people then, uh, when the mass transports of the Jews were uh, still coming and were being selected on the unloading platform, he was also taking the victims from the new arrival uh, Jewish people. Did anybody ever escape from here? Well, the prisoners, they were trying to use uh, all occasions to get out of this camp. And as the first brought here, they were uh, involved in different, uh, they were active in different type of organized groups. So even being here, being in this extraordinary uh, conditions, they were trying again to set some links between them. And as long as they get out of the camp for some duty, some transportation sh or, or some simply work outside the camp, they were um, trying to disappear to find a shelter to wait until the hunting squ uh, squad stopped searching but the answer was that the mm, administration of the camp started to use collective responsibility mm. so then for one escape for example 10 could be uh, locked in the starvation cell and die because uh, somebody was trying to escape or uh, some prisoners as the revenge could be hung in public execution. Well, of course, the historians were trying to answer how many, and the number given is roughly 700 people were trying to escape. But we consider the complex, so the three major camps and the 40 smaller subcamps. Mm. And out of this number, approximately 140 were the lucky escapees. Mm. So si still people who belong to some organization. So once they reach their friends uh, living not far away from here, they could find a shelter for several months. They could be uh, supplied with false documentation and and simply wait until the, the Germans stopped searching. But still everything was very risky. As the prisoners here, they were uh, recorded uh, with all the details so they could be later on uh, traced um, quite easy by the German police. Mm. And were people brought from all over Europe here to the camp and how did they get here? Were it just trains and cattle, cattle sheds? The, uh, most of the prisoners here in Auschwitz, they were from the countries which were occupied by Germans. That's quite um, obvious because of the law which was introduced in those countries. Once they've got new administration, German administration, uh, all the regulations were being changed according to the um, occupants' uh, politics. So, first of all, the, those who could build the opposition, like in uh, Western countries, the Germans introduced a action which was called Nacht und Nebel, and it was just to arrest the people who belonged to different organization, were known from the pre-war pre time as some uh, engaged people, just to eliminate them from building the resistance movement. And there were mass arrests in France, in Holland, in Belgium. Then the people were being sent for different camps, uh, Buchenwald, Sachsenhausen, Dachau, and also here to Auschwitz. For example, from France, this type of transports of non-Jewish people were brought. How did people uh, look after themselves and, and sort of keep themselves happy while they were here at the camp? That was very individual. And as many survivors, that many different stories. Everything depended on uh, how the person was, I mean, in a mental condition, physical condition. Sometimes 
the people were uh, physically what rather weak but they were having just this abilities for uh, different skills different type of work or they were having just this great luck to have uh, friendly people around them with and and together making um, sort of informal group they could just help each other to to keep for another day day it was not anything sophisticated it was just to keep for the next day for the next roll call for the ne next going out for work or the next coming back from work mm. then uh, the people were the longer they managed to stay in the camp they realized that there is different type of work they are to be sent for so that's why they they knew that the work under the roof is safer mm. so they were trying to use any skills they have even some even the little knowledge of carpentry um, uh, mechanic whatever just to get for the job which can bring them a little bit more uh, uh, safe and a little bit more perspective for for uh, surviving the camp once somebody arrived at the camp how long was their life expectancy here again that was very individual and in some uh, researches and also some of the survivors are saying that taking into account all the numbers, we may say that the average would be three months. Mm -hmm. But again, it's very individual. As the survivors are saying, there were sometimes people strong, healthy, uh, with very good skills. Um, I mean skills like building, construction, mechanics. Uh, and they were dying. Mm. They were dying very shortly because, for example, they were terribly beaten because they couldn't uh, fit themselves so easily into the camp reality, which was completely abnormal. Mm. And some of them were, as I mentioned before, people with um, objectively lower chances to, s to survive here. Like, for example, they were teenagers. Mm. So, so the people at the age that they should be at school learning something, not really having some, um, some practical uh, uh, capabilities. But they managed to survive. Mm. So that was very, very individual. Wh when some people had arrived here on trains, uh, if they were disabled, did they basically go to the to the death camp straight away? Do they gassed straight away? No, it depends who they were. Mm. If they were Polish, if they were Roma, if they were Jewish, if they were Soviet prisoners of war, they were different faiths. Mm. The only people who were brought here and sent for the gas chambers were Jewish people. Mm. In terms of Roma, they were being kept in beer canal in family camp and they were kept in the catastrophal conditions so most of them died because of epidemics because of starvation in catastrophal circumstances and those who survived until the 2nd of august 44 they were finally killed in the gas chamber as the germans were just um, the, they were just liquidating the the camp so it's Talking about prisoners of Auschwitz, we need to consider the different transports and different people being sent to. Mm. Not everybody was brought here to be killed in a gas chamber. Auschwitz, first of all, for the Germans, was the place where they were to use the prisoners as slave labor. That's why they were taking the ha young, healthy Jews to be the prisoners, not to send all of them for the gas chamber. Some of them were to be the slave labor because the German economy being involved in, wa in war needed slave labor. So that was why. How many people visit the museum today? Well, the statistics for the last years are over a million. Mm. For the last year, we've got 1,300,000. And from the previous year, it was a little bit more. But we may say that last uh, several years, it's over a million. And most of the visitors, they are young people, mm. students. Majority are Polish uh, students, Polish visitors. Then uh, for the last year, the second group are the visitors from United Kingdom, then from United States. So from, uh, from Poland, United Kingdom, United States, Italy, Germany, Israel, 
Spain, France, South Korea, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Norway, Netherlands, Australia, Sw Sweden, Ireland, Canada, Japan, Hungary, Belgium, China, Russia, Portugal, Denmark, Romania, Singapore, Finland, Brazil, Croatia, Switzerland, and there is the last group called as the other countries. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the first 30 countries uh, the visitors are coming from. Mm. And you get many people from Israel as well coming to visit? Yes, we do have, they are mainly organized groups, they are students and they participate visits to Poland. A part of Auschwitz, they also visit some other sites connected with Jewish, Jewish history, Jewish uh, life here in Poland, which existed before the Second World War. And when the camp was liberated in 1945, how many people were liberated then? The records of uh, Red Cross, which was here together with the Red Army, is 7,000 people. Mm. So it's just a very few, as more than 60,000 people were taken for evacuation for the death marches. And another um, 50 were taken from here before, those who were healthy, strong, those who were still work in the different industry in Germany. Mm. Do you think we've learned lessons today from the Holocaust? It's very difficult question. It's um, actually, we all have got uh, different, let's say, reflections, different analysis to that. As uh, people working here, being involved in uh, research, in education, we do our best uh, to uh, to give the to to uh, answer the question to inform the visitors, uh, but again we are aware that it's just a small percentage of people reaching this place, and unfortunately the um, incidents of mass murders of a different type of violence of ethnic cleansing and uh, mm, something what happened at the Second World War in Europe are repeating. So it's very sad message being repeated in media today, unfortunately. Do Holocaust survivors come back here? And how do they feel when they come back and see the camp? Of course they are coming. Well, they were here from the very beginning. The first two directors of the museum, they were the survivors of Auschwitz. Then uh, the first guides here in the museum, they were also survivors of Auschwitz. So for many years they were here and today they are coming here for lectures. We invite them for the ceremonies like the mm, anniversary of the camp liberation. They are the guests here, the special guests uh, who are also leading the ceremony. So they are giving the, the, the official speeches. And some of them are also coming with their own families as they want to show them something what, uh, what was very important in their family history. Or they are coming with the, with the visitors. It used to be that uh, the Israeli groups were accompanied by survivors. Nowadays, because of the time, it's in many cases impossible. But uh, as they are saying, it's just the legacy, it's something what they feel responsible for. That's why as long as they are able, they are coming here. Okay, Teresa, thank you very much for sharing your time. Thank you.